Hey guys, how y'all doing on a nice soul morning or afternoon at this point in time? I hope you guys had a good lunch. Um, I'm Zen. I'm one of the co-founders of Wet Off. And here today, I'm here to talk about pass keys. Just a quick show of hands. Who here knows about pass keys already and is kind of like familiar with it? Hands, oh, more or less, most of us over here. And um, who's also familiar with like account abstraction? I imagine most people are also kind of like familiar with this as well. Fantastic, fantastic. So um, today I'm going to be talking about pass keys and uh, how you can get that user experience through account abstraction and integrating that with smart wallets on chain. Well, um, the, we're going to, everybody kind of knows what pass keys are. Um, they basically have a fantastic user experience on um, on uh, on desktop as well as mobile, in that especially if you're in the Apple ecosystem, uh, it just kind of works with Touch ID, as you can kind of like see here, um, and then you can log in and you can access. It's a form of authentication that allows you to access most stuff. Now in Web two, um, pass keys are typically used as a second factor of authorization, uh, and. In, but in Web3, people have been experimenting using it as a first factor into different wallets and different accounts and to help you hold and manage your crypto um, because pass keys have nice properties that we'll go into a little bit deeper. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's popular. It's not just uh, in Web3 that pass keys are popular. It's a FIDO thing, which um, it's, a, it's a FIDO, it's, it's, a, it's a standard that's being pushed out by the FIDO Alliance, which means that large brands like, you know, Apple, Google, uh, Microsoft are all implementing it in some ways and forms. Um, and today what we're going to do is we're going to go through first off uh, a little bit more of how a pass key construction might work with a construction. We'll go through a little bit of just uh, exercise of just architecturally how it works. And then we're going to go into us as Web3 off as a wallet as a service um, in, in, in the ecosystem. We've been powering quite a few of these pass key experiences on different applications. So we're going to be going through some of uh, the goods, the bads, and the uglies of pass keys on these different applications. How have the experiences been? Has it been perfect in production or not? Uh, and so on and so forth. So first off, this is what a pass keys architecture looks like. Um, this is just stolen from the Web of N site, right? Uh, and I'm just gonna walk through this super quickly, right? So pass keys have three main, well, realistically, actually two main stakeholders. It's really just the relying party server and then the end user's device. But the end user's device can be broken down into two different components, the browser and then the authenticator. The authenticator, the browser is your browser. Everybody's familiar with that. The authenticator, though, is basically an implementation, and it can it's agnostic in how it can be implemented, but an implementation of a <clears throat> storage mechanism that houses a public-private key pair. And this public-private key pair has several different forms. You can use P255. Uh, you can use SCCP256 uh, R1, but you cannot use... SCCP two five six K one, uh, which is the um, which is the elliptic curve that Ethereum and Bitcoin and many other popular blockchains typically use. So, although we can sign signatures and authenticate with keys, it is specifically not compatible with uh, with 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 Ethereum natively or any of that, right? Um, now, if we walk through the flow, the authentication flow is really quite simple. Uh, the, relay, the relaying party server, which you can think of as a normal DAP or whatever, uh, issues a challenge. This challenge is then uh, relayed to the user's browser and the user's client side. It's relayed down through an, the WebAuthn API um, into uh, the relaying party's uh, authenticator. The authenticator basically signs, creates a new key pair if necessary. Uh, if its existing key pair just basically signs. And then you have your new public-private key pair and credential ID, and then uh, they just relay this information, including the signed attested object, back to the relaying party server. And then at step six, the relaying party server basically just verifies that. 
So how might we combine this with account abstraction? How might, what would um, a straightforward way of doing so would be? Because we can't just rely on that signature because it's on a different curve type. So how might we integrate it into um, a on-chain smart contract which verifies it? Uh, this is kind of a off the top of uh, a, a kind of a, a simple implementation, right? A uh, naive implementation rather of it. And um, everything's the same from step one all the way down to step six, right? However, after step six, um, instead of just verifying it on our server and just keeping it there, we then relay this same signature on chain. And then we either do a user op or just have a verifier on the smart contract level that verifies SECP uh, R1 signatures. Um, and, uh, and we just verify the contents of that signature uh, as kind of a user wish to interact with something, and we're done. And that just kind of allows um, pass case with some form of on-chain verification uh, to indicate user operations. Now, this is a naive implementation. Um, can anybody spot what is wrong with this implementation? If we just naively do this, if we just cite, for example, if we have a, if the if the challenge that we're issuing is something like, hey, I want to send 10 USDC uh, to XXX wallet. Uh, and we sign on that on the hardware enclave in step two through four, and then we relay that on chain. And the on chain, uh, uh, the, the on chain smart contract verifies that signature to send 10 USDC. Can anybody spot? what is wrong with this very naive implementation. Uh, okay, so uh, in particular, um, in particular, the main problem with just signing something that's like saying like, hey, I just want to give 10 USDC to Bob, for example, is that, uh, is that the, the SCCP R1 signature now replicates a user intention to do something. And if the signature object indicates the user intention to do something, and this signature is on-chain and uh, in, the pub, in public, um, it's a very, uh, you, you, you basically become susceptible to replay attacks, right? You, um, you you become susceptible to replay attacks in that, uh, in that like, um, for example, if I want to send ten USDC to Bob, um, and 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 then Bob chooses to receive ten USDC, I, I as Bob can go on chain, get that signature that you already signed, and just infinitely replay that to instead of getting ten dollars, get twenty dollars, thirty dollars, forty dollars, fifty dollars. Um, uh, now, how do we fix this? Does anybody know? No? Anybody care to take a guess? Can we anything? How do we fix this re-entry attack or this replay attack? Fresh challenge. Sorry. Fresh. Fresh challenges. Yeah, that that that's uh that's that that is the way to do it. Um, fresh challenges or basically signing on something fresh each time, which can be a nonce, an incremental nonce, right? So the smart contract level definitely needs a nonce that constantly increments on each user op. Um, and uh, so that each signature is only ever valid once on chain and can only ever be propagated once, ultimately. Now, um, so that's a nice way of implementing uh, pass keys on account abstraction. This implementation kind of roughly works. There are a lot of other nuances to think about, like what consists of user op, how you register what an interaction is, how you make it generalizable instead of not. Um, and there are fantastic implementations of pass keys on chain, on GitHub. Uh, Dymo is one of them that's definitely great, um, along with uh, a couple of others. And uh, and if you guys want to dig in deeper there. Uh, however, now I'm going to share a little bit more about 
um, our experiences with passkeys at Web3 often with applications that have kind of integrated it. Um, the good of passkeys has definitely been that uh, users are becoming more and more comfortable with it. In this room, uh, you know, about 60 to 70% of people, you, all, all of you knew what passkeys were. And passkeys is just something that came out like, you know, February last year. So it's been barely out. Um, large companies are starting to implement it. We're starting to see it across the board on, for example, on Google logins, on Microsoft logins, on Apple, on GitHub, and so on and so forth. So everybody is getting more familiar with passkeys, that's for sure. The user experience is also great. And passkeys is almost kind of like a non-custodial authentication or a touch on that a little bit more, but like using Touch ID to access uh, access something instead of having to enter your password in constantly is a fantastic user experience. As well as the fact that you're using a public-private keypad to sign on your behalf is great in terms of security as well. Um, uh, it, what we've seen is that with seven different dApps that have integrated passkeys uh, with Web3 off um, and that we looked into, uh, passkeys typically see a 57% conversion rate, meaning somebody who starts the passkey, uh, goes on your site, chooses passkey, right, completes the passkey experience 57% of the time, which, and, and it gets access to app, which is better than seed phrases. Seed phrases and MetaMask tend to be at about 20 to 25%. Um, but it's not better than like your standard Google or Apple login just yet. Standard Google Apple login typically see conversion rates at about 60 to 70% depending on the application. But these are definitely a lot of the good things which passkeys have going for it. The bad is that we've actually found that users lose passkeys. Um, and this is not a small percentage of users. Uh, this is like above 1% to 2% of your user base will lose their passkey within a month or two months at this point in time. Um, uh, the reason being, reason being, most Apple users actually have a very, very good experience because Apple is very much kind of like a closed ecosystem of Safari. Everything works with natively on your iPhone to your Mac. But if you are cross-platform, um, if you're doing, for example, um, if you're a Chrome user on Mac, or Chrome user on iOS. If you are uh, Android and you're using Safari, for example, I don't know for what reason, but if you are, um, you you face a lot of compatibility issues. Um, sometimes you can't, the users can't see their passkey. Sometimes they don't know where it is. Uh, they can't retrieve it back. Um, older versions of Chrome and older Android versions, uh, because because you know iOS forces you to update each and every time, it's a little bit. It, 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 passkeys work typically more there, but Androids tend to have a longer and wider version spread across uh, different phones, um, and because of that, sometimes passkeys are not just support uh, are just not supported. Sometimes when people there, there was one bug where somebody erased their passwords, like removed their cache, and then their passkeys disappeared as well, and and, and the passkeys were removed, right? So. Users, like, this will improve as time goes on. I have the absolute confidence that it will improve. But if you're implementing something within the next two to three months and you're looking to implement passkeys, I would highly uh, consider I, I would highly consider that, right? Um, there are also uh, just extra costs for interactions and on-chain verification. Um, uh, with some of the newer upgrades and some L2s, it's a little bit, it's, it's much better now, but before that, on Polygon, it would cost about 12 to 15 cents per signature verification and per user op. Um, so that is an additional cost that you would have to bear. Uh, now, so the bad was a little bit more on the low-level stuff, right? On the high-level stuff is the ugly, right? What's Pass keys look great on the onset, but... What, what, what are the problems with its implementations? Um, so, number one, passkeys weren't... Uh, okay, so the first thing is that um, passkeys is, for those of you who have been following the authentication standards, is actually an evolution of WebAuthn, which was a final standard before, which was basically public-private key pairs on your hardware enclave, on your phone, that is used to sign and authenticate users. Um, 
However, pass keys evolved on WebAuthn, and pass keys are now actually backed up on Keychain or iCloud. And similarly, on Google, it's backed up with your Chrome, with, with your Google account. Essentially, pass, uh, WebAuthn, or in its initial implementation of passkeys, passkeys used to be non-custodial because it's on your hardware phone. It's on your, it's with you, it's physical. But now, because people want greater access, more usage, um, the standard of passkeys allow for it to really be backed up on the cloud. And what that means is that, you know, we are just basically uh, increasing our dependency on Google and Apple. And that's fine for most cases. I think a lot of people don't really care about that. That's just not, not, not the nicest thing, right? Not, the, not, 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 not what it was set out to do initially. The second thing is um, the WebAuthn standard and pass keys equivalently require a, a application-specific server to issue the challenge. Meaning that if two people set up, two applications ask you to set up a pass key, um, the, both applications have, well, application A has pass key A, application B has pass key B. Application B can't see pass key A, and application um, A can't see pass key B. So it's application scoped. And the reason why that's the case is for security purposes, um, it's for user privacy purposes, and so on and so forth. But in Web3, what this means is that if your, you have your account abstracted wallet, right, um, and it's dependent on a particular signature, a particular pass key signature, if the relaying server goes down and can no longer issue your browser challenges, right, you just no longer can sign and no longer can access uh, your wallet. Um, and that's um, another risk of, basically if, if the DAP goes down, you won't be able to access your account abstracted wallet. So given some of these implementation limitations, we have some recommendations, right? Uh, and uh, by no means are these set in stone, but we do recommend typically um, implementing pass keys not as the sole factor to your account abstracted wallet. As one of the factors, yes. As a nice usable factor, absolutely. But as the only factor, I would not recommend it because that just means that 2%, 2 to 3% of your users will lose their keys in two to three months at this point. Um, we also recommend doing it as a lot of the web um, two folk, if you guys have logged into GitHub recently or logged into Google recently, ask you to set up passkeys or Binance, you know. Um, it's a standard login initially and then followed by passkeys as a second factor to access your account. Uh, and that gives you the best of both worlds because if you lose your passkey, you can still fall back to that previous account. Last but not least, we highly recommend that you restrict um, we highly recommend that you restrict your implementations to specific OSs and browser uh, types. So if you're on iOS, only allow it on Safari. If you're on Android, only allow it on Chrome and Edge. If you're on Windows, similarly so. Um, this is because you, uh, passkeys also have a lot of red routes in the UI UX. Like sometimes it presents to you a nice screen to select that, but sometimes it asks you to like, like like put in a security key, like a UB key. Um, so there are a lot of red routes, especially when the browsers can't detect the OS level capabilities um, and the OS level authenticators. So we highly recommend that you restrict it to, for example, as I said, Safari, Mac, Android, Chrome. And that's about it. So that's all for my presentation. Um, I can take a couple of questions if I have time. Absolutely. Thank oh. you so much, Zen. Um, if someone in the has questions, right now. Yeah. Oops. Hi. How are you doing? Hello. I'm good. Um, I'm really sad to miss the first part of the talk, but I'm just wondering that I'm not sure why we have to use the relayer servers to create the challenge. Because um, what if we can just use the hash of the message? on the challenge like the api.encode pack what user want to do so the main thing restricting that 
mm. is uh, you can actually do the challenge. Uh, you, right. there, there's, a, there's a whole bulk of things that you can do in the challenge. But um, the thing issuing the challenge is specific, is specific to domain. So the web authentic API that's implemented on, let's say, Chrome or Safari or whatsoever, the base in uh, domain, URL. yeah, URL specific. So if you just issue it from another domain, you just can't access the same set of pass keys. Right. That's it. It's just it's implemented on the browser level. That's mm -hmm. the restriction. Mm, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If yeah. not, you can reach out to me here on Twitter. And um, our pass keys module and SDK is currently in early access. We have uh, seven dApps already building on it, but it's, it's, it's actively getting more mature and we'd be pushing it out. Um, we'd be looking to actively push it out more. If you guys are keen on building pass keys and keen on improving your user experiences, do let us know. Uh, we'd love to work with you guys. Thank you.